Good morning, everybody. Morning. My name is Raymond Jett. I run ArcadeComponents.com. Uh, I fix a lot of things for people. Uh, it's what I do for a living now that I took early retirement from Cisco Systems. But I've been doing arcade components since 2005, fixing things and building circuits since I was middle school. And I just, I'm, I'm a, just a computer nut. I was the kid that when you go into Radio Shack and you ask a question of the salesperson, they go, ask that kid over there. <laughs> I, I, nerdy, so nerdy. Guess where I, I met my wife? Radio Shack. Radio Shack. <laughs> she sat down in front of the Tandy 2500SX, the first multimedia 286 PC they had with a sub 1X CD-ROM drive, the one that you pushed the whole front and the whole drive slid out and it popped up. And I think Mitsumi made that, if I remember right. A little bitty cable that went to it. Yeah, she was sitting down and they had the Compton's Multimedia Encyclopedia first edition. That was the only one they called multimedia. Every other one was interactive. And it took me years to find a copy of that to put in my collection. But I finally found it two years ago from a guy in Italy. <laughs> not Italy, Texas. No, nope, not Italy, Texas. Italy, the country. And here in Texas, it's called Italy. <laughs> yeah, like there's a tuxedo out towards uh, Lubbock, and it's called Tuxedo. <laughs> All right, so that's a bit of background about me. So one of the things I learned long ago was how to fix computers, because when I was a kid, I bought my TRS-80 color computer, and as soon as the warranty expired, I had uh, eight 4164s that came in mail order from uh, Rainbow Magazine, one of the ads in the back, and I popped that warranty seal and upgraded it myself, but it was because I had the Revision F slash NC motherboards. It's like a couple of jumpers and cut out some caps, plug in some chips, and Bob's your uncle. And then I promptly broke it trying to wire up my own cartridge board. And ordered a 6809 eCPU, and my uncle had a TV repair shop, and he soldered it in, and that was it. And I diagnosed my first computer. I was in eighth grade. But in order to do this, in order to help understand what's wrong with your computer, it's helpful to understand how they operate. And that's what we're doing here today. So, you know, these things are things that we love. You know, and when you're my age, you're collecting things that you played with when you were a kid. And then you're getting into things you wish you could have played with <laughs> when you were a kid. <laughs> Because you couldn't afford it, you know. That's, that's why I learned to fix things when I was a very young kid because we grew up with uh, a single parent until mom married my stepdad and she got laid off every winter from the factory. So, you know, things were always tight. We always had food because she always canned and froze everything. But you, know, you grew up learning to fix things and being self, self reliant. Uh, I grew up as part of the feral generation, as they call it, Generation X. The original latchkey kids where parents expect you to be home by dark. They don't really know where you're at, but they know you're not stupid enough to go do something to really hurt yourself. Well, what mom didn't know didn't hurt her. <laughs> All right, so our key learning objectives. Describe what clock, reset, and watchdog circuits do. We're going to talk about address decoding. We're going to talk about how to access ROMs and RAMs and read them uh, right to the RAMs and how dynamic, ac uh, dynamic RAMs are accessed. They're, they're a bit different. They're a little weird. And then we're going to talk about interrupts. And yeah, it's, it's like your four-year-old. Are we there yet? Are we there yet? I got to stop. I got to stop. Interrupts are really like that. And then address decoding because all these chips have the same address pins on them you know, from zero, A0 on up but they don't tie in the upper address line. So how do you tell one apart from another when you want to access them at different parts of memory? So we have to decode the upper address lines so that when they're in a certain combination, we access this chip. Certain combination, we access that chip. So let's just start off with the most important circuit of all because without it, nothing would run and that's your clock circuit. So here we go. This is where rocks meet computer hardware. Crystals are just that. They are crystals, very thin shaved pieces of quartz crystal, specially shaped to oscillate at specific frequencies. 
they cut them, slice them, grind them, mount them, and that's also a bit why they're kind of fragile. So if you drop one on the carpet, it should be okay, but if you drop one you know, on the table and it goes ping, 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 it might not work afterwards. The newer stuff's a lot better than the older pieces. The older pieces were really fragile, but uh, these do take a, a little bit of care in handling. Now, that mechanical shock, luckily, you know, isn't, doesn't happen very often. When you mount things to a circuit board, you know, they can take a lot more than if you just hit something itself on the floor. Now, they're rated by frequency, they're rated by stability. Uh, cheap crystals, they'll have some drift. And when you put them in circuit, you'll have capacitors next to them because the capacitors help the crystal resonate. So that's why you'll always see those. And sometimes they're adjustable so you can tweak it and get it just on the nose. You know, you'll see that in some of the computers where you'll tweak it just a little bit and then boom, all of a sudden all your color comes back on the screen because then you're, you're hitting your, your clock division to get down to your color burst crystal. They come in a lot of different packages, surface mount and regular. And you'll see that there's different specifications for those like HC49SD, surface mount device. Uh, HC49U, that's the one everybody typically sees in their computer. Then you have the dip ones, which are your crystal oscillators. And the difference is one requires a circuit to operate, like this one, this one, and this one. And the others require five volts to operate. They've got a little chip inside them that does the driving of the crystal and it outputs the specific frequency. It's kind of hard to read on the screen, but this one outputs 40 megahertz. Now, where might you see 40 megahertz at? Or, I'm sorry, that's 80 megahertz. Where might you see an 80 megahertz crystal? Any 486 collectors? You have something that uh, is a 40 megahertz or 386DX40? They divide the clock by two and you get your 40 megahertz. And here's a little picture of the inside of it. You can see that they've got the four pins on it. You've got a resistor capacitor. You've got a chip in here and a little pin that's sometimes used for disable. Sometimes that is used as a voltage tweak to slide the frequency one way or another. That's an, that's an odd one to run into. And this will give you a, an output. It's not necessarily going to be a really pretty square wave output. Sometimes you'll find it has a very small voltage swing to it coming out. So that, that's why they typically come out of that and go into another chip to either buffer it or to divide the clock frequency. And then when you get the output of that chip, you get the nice full you know, TTL swing. Now, the clock circuit times everything. Everything that happens to the comp in the computer is related to that clock signal. Now, don't look at this and go, oh my God, what the heck is that? All this is is something that shows you uh, the address lines, and there's timing considerations in the computer. When you have your address lines, there's a specific area of time where the address bus is valid, and then a specific time where the CPU goes, I want to request memory, and it's got the little bar over it. What does the bar mean? Active low. Active low. So some of y'all were in my other class, the Digital Logic Basics. There's a, a wait and a read, the data bus, and then we have a time when the data bus is valid. But all of these things are timed to the master clock. So if your clock is not working right, if you're dropping cycles, the computer will be, do some weird things. You might see video glitches. If it's off really bad, you might see problems on the screen because you're not getting the correct frequencies to generate the colors. And if it's totally dead, it does nothing. Now, typically, this is going to look like a set of square wave pulses. That's in a perfect world. But really, what you're going to see when you look at it through an oscilloscope is something a bit rough. And, and it depends on how dirty the clock signal is. But as long as you see something that's typically like a 50% duty cycle, you're fine. Yeah, they'll, they'll look a little rough on the, on the top and bottom edges, but uh, just make sure that if they shoot really high one way or another, that your oscilloscope is properly compensated. Now, what do I mean by that? Any oscilloscope owners? Have you compensated your probes? <laughs> what does it mean? 
adjust the capacitance to, so that you get a square uh, top the process. Yeah, you're adjusting the capacitance so you get the best resulting waveform that you see. Your oscilloscopes have a little output for one kilohertz square wave, and you use it to compensate your probes. That, your probes will have a little flathead screw adjustment on it. It's not a screw, it's a little capacitor, and they come in a little plastic tool, and you just can adjust it while you watch the screen to uh, get it so that it looks more like this rather than something with a, a peak here and a, and a drag off to the other side. Once you have them compensated right then, you know that when you start looking at things like this that you're getting an accurate picture of what you're seeing. All right, so we have a clock. Do we have a question? I was going to ask on that last one real quick. Um, yeah. For that, uh, that noise, would you be able to use a cap to help level that off? Some of it, yeah. Some of it's just going to be just the uh, resonance. You know, you're, when you have square waves, you have lots of harmonics and circuits. And if you, if you when you hand layout traces, and you're, you, you can get some weird things like this. Start off with your ground lead on your probe, right? What's that? If you're really wanting to look at a clean signal, then start off having a ground lead on your probe, a fine ground lead. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so the ground lead is very important on your oscilloscope, as he mentioned, because what happens is you know, you've got a really short one, and you're trying to find a place to clip it. So you add an alligator clip and a wire, and you put it down there, and that really screws with what you're seeing, because you have to have a really good ground reference. So keep in mind that if you extend your ground wire on it, it will affect how this looks. So you have to kind of keep that in mind when troubleshooting, if, if you have to extend that ground wire, because you can't really find a good place to do it. It's kind of hard to find places to ground them when you're dealing with surface mount stuff, especially. All right, next one's the reset circuit. So when you power up a computer, it's scrambled. You know, if the CPU's dead, you know, something's dead and you see all the garbage on the screen, you know, that's, that's typically what happens when you, when you first power it on. The reset circuit is just a way for the CPU to initialize itself it'll reset the registers to a known value. It'll go out and uh, uh, clear the interrupts, and then it's gonna go out and look for the first address in memory it should start reading from and start executing code. So a reset signal, if it's not there, the CPU will be off in La La Land, or in the case of a Z80 CPU, it will look totally dead. You won't see any activity on the address bus, you won't see any activity on the data bus. So what you do is you just put your uh, logic probe or oscilloscope on there and look for that reset pulse. Now, different systems have different ways of initializing. They have different things, they call these vector addresses. So they'll go to memory and they'll look in specific spots to pull the address components down. Now they're eight bit, you have 16 bits of addresses, so you, they pull it from two locations in memory, put that together, and they jump to that address to start running things. Other CPUs will just simply start executing at the bottom of memory like the Z80 does. It just goes, okay, I'm going to go to zero and just run whatever's there. But the uh, 6502 and the 6809 are going to grab something very top of memory, put those together, and jump to that address. Now, if you put your ROM up there, it's easy to add it in a ROM, but what if your ROM's not up there? Yeah, you might need something just at that address, like a boot prom or something that's real tiny bits of memory that will sit up there and give you the addresses to jump to. All right, so we have reset and we have slash reset. One is active high. The slash over it means it's active low. When you deal with 8080s, they're active high. When you deal with the Z80s and uh, 6800s, um, 60. 502s, et cetera, they're going to be active low on reset. So what we're, you're looking for is a momentary low pulse on startup. So when you flip the switch and you have a logic probe on there, if you have the logic probe with audio capabilities, for those of you that were in my digital logic basics, uh, I kept harping on using the digital log the logic probe with audio, you'll, you'll hear it go beep beep. You know, it's just a real quick low to high transition. And that's your CPU being initialized at startup. If your reset pulse is not there, then you're going to need to troubleshoot that reset circuit. How long the reset stays low depends on the CPU, but anywhere between 50 to 100 milliseconds is good for just about any CPU out there. So when I say 50 to 100 milliseconds, that just means it's quick. 
You, know, you might have to turn the computer off and then back on to catch it on your logic probe. You, know, you, you might have to uh, set your trigger just right to see it on your oscilloscope as it happens, because it'll just kind of blip on the screen. Now you'll see a lot of different circuits for reset, and they all do something sim similar. You just take a voltage, have it low, bring it high, or have it high, bring it low over time. And we had that area where we had indeterminate logic that we talked about in the, re in the uh, digital logic basics. This will still similar be in that area. So if you have something like a simple reset circuit like this one, where it's just a capacitor here, we're gonna uh, short across this, we're gonna pull this down and send the pulse to the CPU, it's gonna take time for that capacitor to charge up. So you might have this thing called a Schmidt trigger. We talked about that yesterday. Schmidt trigger simply takes that, that slow rising wave and snaps it up fast to make it a, a cleaner reset signal for the CPU. Now you might see two of those in there. Why two Schmidt triggers? Kind of two levels of cleanup. No. One for up and one for down. Why would you need one for up, one for down? So you get a clean off, active, you get a clean active low? No. Two CPUs. Because if you have something over here that starts off low and goes high, What's that bubble mean? Inverted. It's inverted. And so you have a second one to put it back to the right polarity for resetting the CPU. Otherwise, you just, you're saying, go hold and reset forever. Get your work done fast, huh? <laughs> yeah, get your work done fast, 50 to 100 milliseconds, and then we're going to hold you and reset forever. <laughs> And as an example circuit, you know, this is uh, an arcade game called Mr. Do. And we have a Z80. I can tell it's a Z80 because, number one, I've worked on so many Mr. Do's. But on the other hand, pin 26 being reset active low and memory request sitting on pin 19. That's a Z80 CPU pin out. So we have the 555 timer out here as a one shot to do the reset. So there's a variety of different ways to generate these reset circuits. The simplest is a resistor and a capacitor. The one shot is nice and clean. We, we use a 7804 to invert it so it's at the right polarity to reset the Z80. Since this is a nice clean signal, we don't have to use a Schmidt trigger. We get a nice clean pulse from the 555 and we use it there. So there's a lot of different ways to do it, but they all do the same thing. Set the CPU to a known state so that it can start operating properly. Without it, your CPU is off in la la land and, and nothing's going to get accomplished. Now, you might see some reset circuits. There'll be like an 8 pin or a 3 pin that looks like a little transistor. And those are actually quite simple. You've got a power ground and an out. And those will reset your CPU. The 8 pin ones are really cool because they'll monitor the voltage. And if the voltage gets too low, it'll reset the CPU. So if, you're, if you have a circuit like that and your 5 volts dips and you're, and you're, you're working along and your, and your computer suddenly resets, check your power supply because that could affect that reset controller. Have you seen that called a power supervisor? Yes. Yes, 12 something. They have a, a variety of different uh, part numbers for that. MB3771 is a common one from Fujitsu that you'll see in a lot of arcade games, for example. The little um, PST, uh, was it uh, 518, I think? That's, you'll find those in like Neo Geo and a bunch of other arcade games. And I relate things back to arcade games a lot because I repair a lot of those. And the structure is the same, CPU, RAM, ROM, video output, control inputs. It's just a dedicated computer to do one thing, play a specific game. So troubleshooting those, you're going to see that momentary pulse. You're going to see that low to high transition. If you press the reset button and you don't see this, then you got to do a little bit of troubleshooting in your reset circuit to figure out what's going on. Is your switch bad? Do you have a bad transistor or a diode in there? Do you have a cap that's dead? So, but the key is, is look for that transition. 
either on power on or when you press the uh, reset button. When you do it with an oscilloscope, but keep in mind that it's just going to flash across the screen real quick. So make sure your trigger is set properly so it, it, you'll see it on the screen for a bit longer and you'll see more of the, of the uh, reset signal. Otherwise, you just stuff's just flying across your oscilloscope. All right, so troubleshooting these, always start with your eyes. Look to see you know, what's going on in the circuit. I can't tell you how many games I've repaired over the years where operators just take the boards and throw them in a box. And you get it out of the box and you look at it and it's like, okay, reset's not working. And you look over and you see the capacitor in the reset circuit bent over with the leg pulled halfway out of the capacitor. Yeah. Why spend a lot of time troubleshooting something electronically when your eyes can spot it immediately? One time at an arcade, I had to fix a cabinet to live while people were playing around me where uh, the boards weren't mounted at all. They were just stacked with little pieces of cardboard in between them that were too small. And I had to just arrange it so they weren't shorting to each other. Yeah. Operators do strange things. They'll use speaker wire to run power. You know, you'll see bell wire running power. And, or and video in one case. Yes. I had to wire from one cabinet to the one next to it to, di to diagnose where the fault was in the video. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Edge connectors for bringing everything into the board. And you'll see where somebody will solder a paper clip or a staple to act as the edge connector contact. Yeah. But, you know, that's the one thing I learned when uh, I had a, an uncle mentor me when I was a kid. He had a TV repair shop, and he said, always start with your five senses. Does something smell hot? Does something look discolored from heat? And do you um, see something that looks broken, scratched, you know, where gouges go across traces? You know, you start with the physical stuff that you can interact with your senses. You know, do you smell something getting really hot? Be careful. Uh, run the back of your hand over things and you, you'll feel the heat coming off a lot better because your back of your hand's a lot more sensitive. If you have to touch it, yeah. quick, <laughs> quick, because I ended up with blisters on my fingers from a uh, shorted CPU once and they do get finger blisteringly hot. Yeah, no, at least once I've had that happen, I have basically a soldering iron type burn from the chip. Yeah. Back of your hand is also good so that you don't inadvertently grab hold because you're getting electrocuted. <laughs> <laughs> I did that once with an Apple II power supply. The Dynacomps don't have discharge resistors across the mains filter caps on the Apple IIs. If you have the Aztec, they have 100, there's 150K resistors, I believe, across the mains caps. So when you turn it off, it'll discharge them. But the Dynacomps don't. All right, so no pulse. Like I said, look for all the stuff you see uh, and hear. You know, you might hear something crackle. Uh, faulty IC, you know, make sure you have five volts coming properly if you're using those reset controllers. And then, uh, but they are terribly simple circuits typically to, uh, to troubleshoot. Now, watchdog circuit. What does a watchdog circuit do? It barks at the CPU to get its attention. It's a circuit that the CPU must periodically go do something to reset. If it doesn't reset it, it goes bonk over the head of the CPU and resets it. Now, if you have a problem where your CPU can't boot, then you'll get a condition known as stuck in watchdog. Stuck in watchdog, you know, like on a, I'll just go back to another arcade game, Neo Geo, you'll, you'll sit there and see on the screen, garbage on the screen, you'll hear a tick, 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 coming from the speaker. That's the watchdog circuit, resetting the CPU. Come on, start up, come on, start up, come on, start up. And it won't start up because the Varta has leaked the NICAD and turned the uh, battery backup circuit into mush, which caused the battery backup, or the, um, the memory circuit, you know, the, the backup RAM to spuriously output constantly to the bus, keeping the CPU from starting. Well, I have a short watchdog story. Uh, I had a, some unattended equipment that when there was a crash, it didn't reboot the machine. And it turned out that uh, this was a 6009 and it was hitting the, the, the colloquially called halt and catch fire instruction. And whoever designed the PALS 
kind of forgot to include the read line in, in the or the, 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 the WR line in the uh, in the equations. So it was re it was resetting the watchdog on reads. <laughs> and the uh, that test instruction basically reads the entire 64k address space every second or so. And so it was more than enough to keep this thing in the middle of nowhere uh, from rebooting. So some example circuits. We have the watchdog reset coming in. That's the CPU saying, OK, I need to reset it. But notice what's feeding it, vertical blank. In most of your computers, you're going to have a vertical blanking signal that's hammering the, re the uh, interrupt line. And your CPU is going to go, OK, I got an interrupt from vertical blanks. We're going to talk about the interrupts here in a little bit and what, what that means. And it goes, OK, I'm going to go off and service this. But if it doesn't go off and service it, and part of that servicing is most likely going to be the watchdog reset, just you know, depends on the system you're working on as to how they reset it. But if, if that's not reset 60 times a second, it's trying to reset your computer. <laughs> so that's where you get the watchdog signal coming in there to hammer the CPU over the head to try and restart it. It's like a dead man switch. Yeah, it's a lot, a lot like a dead man switch. If you're you watch the nuclear weapons, if I don't you know, hit the button every day. <laughs> so if you're stuck in Watchdog, you have to start with the basics. Do I have a clock? Do I have a reset? Yes, do I have a reset because we're stuck in Watchdog. We have clocks, yes, because we're stuck in reset. So that part's typically all working. But check your ROMs. Do you have corroded pins on the ROMs? Do you have cheap sockets? I, I hate those sockets that say RN on them in the middle. They're single wipe with the legs coming in towards the center. And they will inevitably break right here. And then there's nothing to touch the leg. But you'll look and you go, oh, that looks okay. You put it in. But if you hold it up to the light, you can see a nice big square part through the socket where there's supposed to be a pen contact. Because if it can't read the ROM, it can't run, and it can't reset that watchdog. RAM must be good. Uh, the Tempest PCXT board that was in the auction last night uh, had one of them that was dead. Yeah, because it had a shorted RAM in the first bank of memory. And if, the, if you have problems with the first bank of memory, the system will not start because you got to have that scratch pad RAM to do things with. Now, if it had bad bits, the BIOS should have come up and, and gave a beep error code for having problem with the first 16K of RAM because it goes out and checks that so that you have some known good memory to base everything else off of. But the bit was shorted, so it was off in la-la land. Address decoding issues, stuck interrupts. We're going to talk about stuck interrupts in a bit. Basically, anything that can cause the CPU to go off into la-la land can cause you to have a stuck in watchdog. Now your data bus is going to carry all the data to and from your CPU. There's typically going to be eight data bits, but it really just depends on, on the CPU. You, know, you could have 16 uh, data bits for your 286s, your 80386SX, uh, 486SLCs uh, that are you know, pin drop in for your 386SXs, 32-bit, uh, 64-bit, et cetera. And that's just how much data comes in to the CPU at a time when you're going in and reading that data. So this bus needs to be clean. It needs to be working. And if you have stuck bits on this, then you're going to have problems. Some systems will separate out your RAM and your ROM uh, off into different bus areas. This is an example of a Pac-Man where you've got the uh, Z80 Sync bus controller out here. And all the uh, RAMs are on the other side of this. All the ROMs are directly attached to the CPU. So if you have a problem, which side is it on? Is it a problem with the ROMs? Is it a problem with the ROM sockets? Uh, is it a problem over here with the RAM on the other side of this? Or is it a problem with the module itself? Those are modules that snap on into sockets on top of the board like little daughter cards. They're a pain in the neck. And they'll have bit pins under them uh, or the pins broken off. And then suddenly you're not getting your data bus across it, and then it's dead. And if it's dead, what is it typically stuck in? Watchdog. Watchdog. So your data bus will typically have transceivers that control 
the direction of the data flow. If we want to write something, it flows this way. If we want to read something, it flows this way. We have control pins on these, and the control pins go to the read-write circuit, so we can control which direction this goes. So this just tells you that, okay, I've, if I have a stuck bit out here, where is it stuck? Is it stuck on this side because of a bad CPU? Is it stuck on this side because of a bad bus transceiver? Or is it stuck over on this side because you have a RAM or a ROM that's got a shorted pin? Uh, so you'll have to check on both sides of that, you know, before, after those modules and chips in the path. These controls help control the flow of the data. So that's, that's why it's important to understand that when you have something like this in the bus, you have to isolate it. Which side is the trouble on? It's just like you know, isolating something in a car. You don't have fuel coming into the car. So you check, well, first off, do you have gas? Yeah. Is the fuel pump running? Is the fuse blown to the fuel pump? You know, is your uh, main uh, fuse blown because you tried to jump start your car and put the jumper leads on backwards? <laughs> There's a bit of isolation to get down into figuring out what's wrong with it. And it's the exact same here. Now, when you get into the bigger CPUs, you'll have more of these chips that will handle the, um, um, the wider data bus path. Address bus, you'll typically have drivers like these on the schematic. There'll be something like 74 LS244s, uh, 74LS367s, and you know, don't worry if you don't remember any of those numbers. Just you know, when you look at the schematic, you go, oh, okay, those are the buffers on the address lines. They're there because the CPU might not have enough drive power to drive those buses to all the different devices that are connected. So we add these to provide improved what? Was it the term we used yesterday? Fan out, Fan out to improve that. Now, when you have your address lines, you have how many on an 8-bit CPU? Typically 16. They can be smaller, like if you have a 6507. Where would you find a 6507? Atari 2600. Yeah. You guys are on fire. So if you need more than what your CPU supports, then you get into bank switching. So if those of you that like to play around with CPM machines or those of you that uh, have REUs on your Commodore 64, you know, I see a Commodore shirt. <laughs> You're doing bank switching to access more memory than what the CPU can support on the address lines. Now your buffering is going to protect the, your CPU from damage. Like if you go in and you insert a cartridge or remove it, one of the popular upgrades on a TRS-80 Coco is to drop in a little board that has the CPU on it and has some of those buffers on it to help protect the CPU. Uh, that's what I did when I fried mine as a kid, was plug in a homemade cartridge board and shorted something out. Oops. Now, let's talk a little bit about address decoding. When you look at these RAMs, these are 6264s. What's a 27C64? EEPROM. So these are all 8K devices, so 64 kilobit, 8 bytes. So 64K divided by eight, you get eight kilobytes, 64 kilobits, but they have address lines from A0 to A14. Uh, wait a second, no. That's wrong. Where in the world did I get that schematic from? <laughs> That's a clip from a schematic. So we have 8K, we need to use the top three address lines, 13, 14, 15, this should go to A12. They all have the connections from A0 to A12. So how do you tell one apart from the other? You have to take the upper address lines, A13, A14, and A15, and use those to determine which one of these you want to access. Now, chip select. <laughs> yes, you have chip select and you have output enable on these. And so we're going to take those upper address lines above A12 and decode them so that we can access, like say, for example, we're on a Z80, this needs to be at what address to start? Zero. zero. So we'll say from zero to one FFF, that's the first 8K bank, and we can put these at the second bank, which would be at 2,000, and this one at the next one should be 4,000, and those are in hexadecimal. 
And so to do that, we need to decode address lines A13, A14, and A15. Does anybody remember from yesterday's Digital Logic Basics what chip is a 3 to 8 decoder? 138, yeah. See, these, these chips all have these common things that they do, and you can use them in great ways on these computers. So address decoding, our address lines A13, A14, and A15, if they're all zeros, we're at the bottom bank of memory. If A13 is high, we're accessing that second 8K bank of memory, and so on and so forth. That's the, uh, the binary that we're looking at the upper address lines. And so we'll use that with the 74LS138 so that we can decode this and enable the uh, specific memory. So we can see our ABC, that's A13, A14, A15. We can take our enables and just tie them high and low as needed and just leave them that way because we want to always decode this for that bank. And then our outputs, you can see the lows coming across here on the different output pins. And so we use that with that combination of those upper address lines to determine which chip we're going to access. Now, some of this is put into different chips. So if, you're, if you have a Commodore 64, what chip are you going to look at if you're having problems with your uh, chip selects and accessing different ROMs? PLA. PLA. Your PLA chip. 906114-01. <laughs> Gosh, I'm such a nerd. <laughs> and so this is how we can decode those address lines without using a custom logic chip like a PLA. And so we're going to take those lines, connect them in, and then we'll come out here from Y0 to here. We can put Y1 to here. So now we have this one at, at uh, 0 and this one at 2,000 and then 4, 6, and 8,000 over here to this one. Make sense? Yeah. Yes, sir. We have a question. Um, on a Z80, where does this, how does the stack function on that? Because I know on a 6502, you'd have to have RAM down at 100 for the stack to work. So how does that work on a Z80 exactly? 16-bit stack pointer. You can point anywhere you want. Yeah. Thank you. From the man in the Z80 t-shirt. <laughs> 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 Thank you. That's perfect because I'm not a programmer. Yeah. I fix hardware. <laughs> I was actually wondering the same thing because I was wondering, does the code at zero need to jump over the stack? <laughs> <laughs> so now let's look at reading ROMs. So we know that we have to have a specific bit of address decoding to enable the ROM, but there's, there's some certain pins on this that we have. We have chip enable, the, the control for device selection, and we have output enable. You know, can we output the data to the bus or not? Oftentimes you'll find one of these connected to ground. Uh, you can have the chip, uh, in the chip enable set low, but without the output enable low, it won't output anything to the bus. So oftentimes you'll find the chip enable just simply set to ground on the computer. Now, these things all have pretty common pinouts. Uh, once you get to EEPROMs. When you're not at the EEPROM world, then you're looking at something that's going to have some oddball pinouts. Because the EEPROMs, once you learn the pinouts, then you just take your logic probe down and you know where you're at. But when you're dealing with the, the OTP ROMs, uh, the one-time programmable or the mask programmable ROMs, then you get into a world of oddball pinouts. You know, like uh, TRS-80 color computer. Any fans of that in here? Yeah, yeah it was Motorola. Only a couple, yeah. Motorola. So you have 24-pin ROMs that are 8K by 8. And the industry standard was 28-pin devices for that. You'll find that in the Commodore 1541, where sometimes Commodore would go in and they ran out of mask ROMs. So what do they do? They make a little adapter circuit board, plug a 28-pin ROM in it, and plug it into the 24-pin socket. So you might open up your 1541 and go, what's this? Factory did it. Also, those mask ROMs sometimes have custom chip selects. Yes. You're getting right to exactly where I was going next. The custom chip selects, where you look at stuff that is positive going 
or negative going on the enable lines. They did this a lot in the really old days. Sometimes you'll find ROMs that are clocked when you get something really old, where you have to have a clocking signal to it to synchronize it with its output to the bus. Wait till you go and uh, play around with some of the, the really old versions of the Commodore Pets and their custom RAM and custom ROMs that uh, Moss created. The Unobtainium RAM. Now, when you see some of these also, you might find these as bipolar proms. And you might find some of those in uh, some fairly decent sizes, but they're, they're all similar in that you have to blow something to program them. Whereas you're forcing a state change on an EEPROM at, uh, at the super tiny level, you actually have microscopic fuses in a bipolar prom. So um, it's like Wheel of Fortune. Once you buy a prize, it's yours to keep. And once you program it, you're not going to reuse it for something else unless it magically has all the same bit set except for one that you can blow over here to, to make it work for your circuit. Well, so. That is the thing though, there are sometimes uh, fuses to like take it out of development mode, put it in production mode or something that are like one-way gates. Yeah, they have security function on some of the PALs uh, to where you can't reverse engineer them easily, but there are people now that have developed some little circuits, you just drop it in, push a button, and it sends a lot of goes into it, goes out and analyzes it, and it comes out with the equations and says, here you go, which is awesome. And there are guys out there that do that. There's a uh, PLA wiki, or it was a PLD wiki, uh, out on the web where they've done that for a lot of the uh, gals and pals and uh, things that are secured on arcade games. Because you know, once those die, you know, the manufacturer's not going to give you the code. On the Commodore 64, we got lucky in that there were some 82 S100s that uh, uh, Commodore used, that Moss used. And so I took one of those, put it in my programmer, dumped it, posted it on my website, and then got a nice contact from the mess team. Hey, can we use that to improve the emulator? I'm like, yeah, just give me credit. I don't care. That's what it's out there for. It's for everybody. And then that got folded into MAME, but yeah, that's cool. Nerd cred. <laughs> Yes, this is why it always pays to check. Accessing static RAMs. Static RAMs are like EEPROMs that you've got your chip enabled, you've got your output enabled, but you also have another control line that tells it whether you're trying to read something or write something. Now, remember I said that you have an output enable, something that says, okay, this chip can output to the bus. So you can do the chip enable low and then send it a low on the write line that says, I want to write to you. So that enables the chip and you can write to it. You don't want to enable output when you're writing to it. So you're just going to enable those two. Now, there are some special lines on this that says that if you set these in a particular state, you can put this into a low power shutdown mode. And the low power shutdown mode is where you get your battery backed memory. So you can go in and, and sometimes you'll find this inside the chip, those infamous Dallas semiconductor ones that when they die, what do you do? You dremel the side and add a coin cell battery to the top. Yeah. So that's what it's doing when you put the, that in that special mode, it goes into that low power standby. So it, it only draws like micro amperes, you know, super tiny amounts of power, just enough to keep the memory intact until the next time you power it up. But this gets us back to that, those truth tables again. If you remember from yesterday's discussion, if you were in my session for Digital Logic Basics, we, if we have our chip select high, we don't care what the output enable is or the write enable is, we're going into the high impedance mode. And uh, on the I.O. pins, that's that standby mode to where we're using super low amounts of power such that we can operate it off of like a coin cell battery or what's worse than a coin cell battery? Varda, destroyer of worlds. What's worse than Varda? No. It begins with an M. Maxwell? Maxwell, destroyer of apples. <laughs> if you had an Apple II GS or if you had an, um, a Mac that had one of those batteries on it, we also have those Maxells on Capcom CPS2 games in the arcade. And those are some expensive games. And what happens is, is those are lithium. So NICAD is the slow creeping death. 
you get that caustic oil that leaks out and everything grows all these blue green crystals and it just spreads and you see the area of wetness around the battery and everywhere that that wetness you see in the dust and dirt on the circuit board all that area is corrosive as all get out well the max cells the lithium batteries when they outgas it is extremely corrosive and it is almost instantaneous so i had one of those on my bench it was about dead i'm sitting here i cut the 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 wire leads off because i was i take the batteries and i uh, heat seal them into uh, like a you know, plastic sheets so that you know they don't touch each other so when i throw them away or take them to recycling you know you don't have something violent happen with these batteries because let's face it they they can get pretty violent at times especially the lithium ones well i cut the positive nipple too close the battery started outgassing and so i threw it down into the trash can under my bench set my my cutters down opened all the windows and doors to the shop and left for a couple hours and i came back and those cutters you know they were the the typical cheap uh blue insulated little cutters that you know cost you 6.95 at the store those things were brand new and when i got back they were rusted so hard i could not move them and that's how corrosive those things are. So when you look at the leakage on the board, you see all this orange, crusty, nasty stuff and pins that are just basically eaten off the chips from those. So yeah, their damage is very fast. Whereas NICAD, you got some time to get in there and address it and it's a lot easier to remediate. All right, so what do we do if we uh, wanna do dynamic RAMs? This is a 64K dynamic RAM. How many address lines do we have? Eight plus eight. We have eight. And it's like, how in the heck do you get 64K out of eight pins? We have to reuse pins. So we have to do things faster than what the, the CPU is looking for. But what we're going to do is we're going to have to multiplex. <laughs> 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 so we're going to set an appropriate signal. We're going to read to this or we're going to write to this. Then we're going to send the low address lines and toggle the row address strobe line. So we have a CAS and a RAS. Row address strobe, column address strobe. So we're going to feed it the lower half of the address bus. Then we're going to quickly send the upper lines and toggle the CAS and the chip's going to take those together and access that cell of memory that you're trying to read to or uh, write, read from or write to. So you'll see this like in the Commodore 64, you'll see these in the TRS-80 uh, color computers, Osborne. Uh, there are so many computers out there that use dynamic RAMs, even the Atari 400s, 800s, and up into the XLs and XE series. And so they can be a little bit confusing when you first look at it and go, how do these things operate? Well, you're gonna feed them part of the address, toggle this line, feed them the other part of the address, toggle the other line. No. Well, the Z80 would do the refresh, yeah. which was excellent. But with this, we're going to use something like a 74LS157 or a 257 chip, which are two to one data selectors, so that we can take the uh, address buses and take the low bits and high bits on alternating pins, select which ones we want to send down as we send the CAS and the RAS signal. So you still have to have those to, to determine which signal gets to the chip. So that adds a little bit of complexity in the troubleshooting. Whereas, okay, is it the problem with the address line getting from here to here? Or is it a problem with the select circuit of which address line to send it? And then we have the, is the RAM good or not? So if the RAM appears to be bad, it's probably the RAM. But you replace the RAM and you still have problems, you want to come back over here and, and check your multiplexers. Now, if it's a Commodore 64, what else do you want to check? No? Brick of death? <laughs> you should probably have bad RAM. If you have bad RAM, you probably have a power brick issue on your 64. Yeah. And if you have really, really old computers with 16K uh, DRAMs, check your minus 5 volt line because some of the oldest 4116s, if you lost the minus 5 volt line for the charge pump, you would actually 
have the chip self-destruct internally. <laughs> I had some 64K chips in, uh, that I put in a cocoa that needed minus five. Yeah. Well, it was a cocoa one and there's a jumper for that. That's, that's a, a very weird, odd yeah. version of that RAM. Yeah. So we have the, uh, the LS157s, and if you, if you take note of my little verbiage here, this is actually a, a capture of the schematic for a SX64. So this is what you'll find in the computer. Now interrupts. Are we there yet? Are we there yet? I gotta go. Can we stop the car? I gotta go. That's what your your in, your interrupts are doing to your CPU. They're like, hey, stop. You know, I, I mentioned that we have vertical blanking as something that drives an interrupt. So 60 times a second or 50 times if you're over across the pond, you tap on the CPU on the shoulder and say, hey, 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 hey. And what you're doing is you're taking the, the interrupt when it happens. You're making a jump to some code that you need to, to run. You're going to service that interrupt routine. Then you're going to jump back into your regular code. So this is where you can do things that are happening during the vertical time where you flip the beam from the bottom of the screen to the top of the screen. And that's typically where you'll go in and change stuff in uh, RAM. If you want to do something that, you know, scroll something, then not have it show on the screen as, you know, doing it while you're drawing the screen. Uh, so your CPU is going to go out there and it's going to say, okay, I got the interrupt. I need to look at this table and see where, which interrupt this is and where I need to go run the code. And then we come over here, we service the interrupt, and then we jump back into our main program. So happens constantly. Yeah, can you swing that door closed? It's getting a little loud and distracting outside. Thanks. And so this happens automatically. This allows your computer to go do something on a regular basis. You'll see a lot of this um, in multi-CPU systems where one CPU wants to tell something to another. Like say um, an arcade game where you want to tell the sound CPU, hey, I've got a sound for you to play. You toggle its interrupt, and then it goes out and looks at the, uh, the port where the data presents itself, grabs the data, and goes and plays the sound. Now here we can see that we have V blanking coming in to trigger that interrupt. Now we have two different types of interrupts. We have maskable and non-maskable interrupts. So we have IRQs and NMIs. Non-maskable, you can't ignore. It's like when, when uh, your kid goes, I'm going to throw up. <laughs> you don't want to mask that when you want to pull the car over immediately, open the door or open the window. I had a professor talk about interrupt masking and ignoring and so on. He said, okay, so you're watching TV and your wife is calling for you, so I want to put on like earmuffs or something so that you can't hear her, only the TV. So that would be uh, uh, disabling the, the interrupt uh, request lines and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, what is it? You can clear and, dis uh, clear and set interrupt on a x86. Uh, but then there's a non maskable interrupt, which is what you're talking about. And in his example, it was like your wife gets so upset with you, he, uh, she hits you with a baseball bat. <laughs> but you put on a football helmet because it turns out that, the, uh, that the, some of those motherboards actually uh, would let you mask the non-maskable interrupt, but you had to do it outside the ship. <laughs> it was like an arms race. <laughs> now, if your interrupts are stuck, you might enter a condition where your CPU might not start. So if, it's just another thing in a list of things to check if the CPU is not starting. And that was my last slide. So the thing is, is that this is not hard. It's, it's just looking at it and examining and understanding how the different circuits work and come together. It's just like when you're dealing with a car, you've got fuel, air, and spark, but you also have an alternator that charges the battery. You've got a battery that provides you the power. You've got a key switch that turns it on. So these are the different parts of the car. We have similar things that are different parts of the computer. So understanding those makes it easier to go in and troubleshoot those and do the repairs. So we talked about the watchdog circuits, clock and reset, the, how you access the static and dynamic RAMs, how the uh, uh, interrupts are used and what address decoding is and how that allows you to access specific chips on the computer at specific addresses in memory. And so I'd recommend that uh, you go out to the Internet Archive and go to the uh, playhooky.com digital electronics page uh, it's a nice bit of a uh, kid out there to learn. And then uh, we already did the digital logic basics. Up next is the computer reset, preserving a lifetime collection. Noel's in town. And we're going to be talking about the history of computer reset and the liquidation effort that took a little bit over three years. 
and a huge team of volunteers, which Andy was one of them. And with that, I'd like to say thank you for your time, and do you have any questions? Quiet crowd. All right. Well, thank you, and I hope you enjoyed the show.